afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar on the CUT proposal to advance cash reform. Um, we have a lot of people joining us today from different parts of the world. Um, I am the facilitator of this webinar. My name is Sarah Almer. I'm the coordinator for the Cash Learning Partnership CAL. So, uh, first of all, I want to give a very big thanks to the humanitarian um, Leadership and Learning Academy, HLA, for having given us the opportunity to use their platform to enable more participants to join. So, thank you very much for that. Um, I also want to get uh, a special word of thanks for our esteemed um, panelists, being Nigel Simmons from Oxfam International, Satwik Seshasai from Segovia, and Julia Seitz of GPPI. So, uh, once again, warmly welcome to everyone. Um, we chose to call this webinar on the CUT proposal to advance the cash reform. And the reason for that is because um, following up now from the World Humanitarian Summit, while cash benefited from an unprecedented attention from a lot of high-level policymakers, um, there is also a sense that the summit did not fully deliver on its initial vision. The call from the Secretary General, for instance, with regards to cash assistance becoming the preferred and default response, um, was diluted into promises of incremental change. The World Humanitarian Summit did, however, generate an important momentum for change, which Cal believes is fertile ground to take decisive steps to implement a much-needed cash reform. Um, and it's important in this context to continue to advocate for the foundations for a world which, by cash, is being considered on equal path to other forms of assistance. So, with that in mind, the webinar will explore innovative pathways for change as regards to cash transfer programming, but also the wider related system that we use for humanitarian aid and that is necessary to deliver on the initial vision of the World Humanitarian Summit. And um, I'll be starting by looking at some of the commitments um, that help has been working on trying to support the monitoring through the Agenda for Cash. Then I will be handing over to Nigel Simmons of Oxo International, who will look at localization, uh, followed by Satwick from Segovia, looking at a more diverse type of partnership with private sector. And uh, last but not least, Julia Steve of GPPI, uh, looking at the subject of change within the humanitarian and institutional setup and uh, some of the work that she has done around that. We'll then have a longer discussion of about 10 minutes, um, followed by a wrap-up. So, in terms of monitoring commitments through the agenda for cash, many of you who are joining this webinar will have been involved in the agenda for cash before the World Humanitarian Summit. Um, it was a consultative process that involved a large part of the CALP membership and the wider community of practice. And from CALP's side, to be able to keep the momentum generated by the World Humanitarian Summit, we will kickstart a series of discussion and action research around the future of CASH in a substantially reformed architecture that we chose to call CASH 2020. And we're also looking to set up a mechanism to follow up on the commitments of the World Humanitarian Summit in order to provide a degree of accountability and accompaniment to those stakeholders who wish to implement commitments that they made at the World Humanitarian Summit, including the grand bargain. And um, the agenda for cash um, is a particularly strong document, um, we feel, from CAL's side, because it is done by implementers themselves. It sets out a quite clear and specific roadmap with regards to the changes that need to happen to bring through a broad-based cash reform. Um, and as many of you will be aware, CAL has also recently increased its membership, and with that, there is a lot of opportunities to maintain this momentum. And I think the big interest in this webinar also reflects that. And I also want to take an opportunity to thank everyone who has and will continue to input into the agenda for cash. And how we are looking into doing this is to partner with like-minded organizations. Now, that's 
is not necessarily limited to organizations working on cash, but also those that work on specializing on trend analysis and strategy research institutes, etc. And uh, we build together with others. We have a unique opportunity to generate and incubate discussion so that we can bridge the gap between those in decision-making powers and those that have very practical solutions on the ground. So this is the vision for Cash 2020 from um, our side. And in order to do so, um, we are looking to um, establish a complementary mechanism coming out of the World Humanitarian Summit and the Grand Bargain. And there will be a lot of different opportunities and initiatives that will become clear as the commitments are being um, made more uh, official and organized in the coming period. The purpose for the cash mechanisms will be twofold. Firstly, it's about bringing a degree of mutual accountability. So it's not about auditing, but it's really about emphasizing the quality aspects and sharing the learning around that. Also to be able to provide accompaniment. So CALP has a quite um, advanced capacity strengthening program, which also looks at organizational capacity strengthening. And a lot of organizations at the moment summit made different commitments on how to increase the scale and quality of a craft transfer programming. And it's recognizing the support that CALP can deliver in that process. So at the moment, we are looking um, at working together with others to um, implement uh, the uh, plan um, and to strengthen um, what has already been worked on following up to the World Humanitarian Summit. And uh, we are very much welcoming feedback, obviously, on what uh, the current plans are. Um, and we hope that we will have something concrete up and running towards the end of this year, and um, we are also currently seeking for opportunities of partnership and funding around it. So with that, I am happy to take questions as far as the agenda for cash and the related work that CALP has done um, with regards to that. So while um, we do so, um, I can just start by giving a short introduction to Nigel and the following panelists as well. Nigel is currently the Humanitarian Director um, of Oxfam. He joined Oxfam in 2012. He's got uh, more than 20 years experience in relief and development sector. He's worked for ACS, um, TFM, Christian Aid, etc., moving from roles in engineering to management. He also acted as the focal point for disaster risk reduction in the 2011 revision of the Spear Handbook. And he is interested in issues of resilience and how to better in enable the emergence of local capacity. And we will speak particularly to that today. And as mentioned in the introduction, Nigel will be followed by Satwick and. Satwick has built and deployed technology system in global enterprise and entrepreneur environment. As the program director first for IBM, he helped to develop the Smart Cloud um, platform across 17 countries, including multiple international social programs. Currently, Satwick is the chief technology officer of Segovia. Julia Steeks, who will uh, end the uh, webinar session, she is the director of Global Public Policy Institute, and her research and consulting work focuses on international development, humanitarian assistance, and public-private partnerships. She currently represents GPPI in the Inspire Consortium that also supports some of ECHO's policy development, and uh, she is a member of the editorial board of Roots-led newly established humanitarian studies series. All right, so I have a question here from um, Valerie um, asking about strengthening organizational capacity and the specific tools. Um, it is a broad subject, you're absolutely right. Um, CALP has developed a organizational capacity assessment tool that is available free of charge on our website, which looks broadly um, at the type of changes and processes that organizations need to 
the undertaking in order to bring cash transfer programming to scale. So um, if you have a look at that, Valerie, and in case there is follow-up uh, questions, then I'm happy to take those as well. And there is another question regarding the strategy to engage and build capacity of new organizations. Um, very good question uh, from Omar Hassan. And have a look also at what CALP is currently um, doing in its um, organizational capacity assessment strengthening. We are piloting at the moment a program with five German NGOs, and there is some learning on that also that should be available very soon on the website. And with that, I will be handing over next to Nigel Simmons. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here, and um, uh, my topic is to look at uh, how we achieve greater localization of, of humanitarian assistance. Um, and I suppose I, I'm making two broad assumptions in this presentation. One is that um, the sort of rationale for localization, the value of uh, having more capacity at the local level, more local actors directly responding um, is a given. So I'm not particularly going to address why uh, we think that's going to help the overall humanitarian uh, project writ large. And the other thing is that many of the barriers to local organizations delivering high quality cash programming are actually very similar barriers to other forms of humanitarian programming as well. Um, and it should also be obviously noted that I am from an INGO. I work for Oxfam, uh, and so this is my perspective. But I'd very much love to hear added contributions from others on this call um, who perhaps you know, work at the local level and see the system from a different perspective. So I offer these reflections, but I'd, I'd very much welcome the dialogue because I think to understand how we achieve the same, it requires uh, multiple perspectives about how the system functions. So I think one of the key issues for, for local capacity is around sustainable and predictable financing. One of the advantages for many international institutions look at a multiple number of emergencies, which means we have an th ongoing throughput of finance, which allows us to retain capacity. Now, if you're a local organization in one specific area and a crisis comes along every few years, it can be extremely challenging to fundraise in the sort of quiet times, so to speak, which makes it very difficult to retain capacity, let alone grow it. But then when there is a crisis, this enormous flood of resources arrives, and it's like trying to drink from a fire hose. So um, that is, is, is genuinely difficult, and, and one of the challenges for the humanitarian sector is how we can smooth out that curve. How can we get more sustainable financing in the in between times so that um, organizations can retain and invest in their capacity. Clearly, the resilience agenda is important here um, and, and, and finding new forms of financing that don't just respond to emergencies but invest in preparedness and planning is, is also a critical element. And that's going to be an ongoing campaign uh, with, with donors and the community writ large. But even when those uh, floods of resources do come in, they're, they're very unpredictable. Um, you might get a little, you might get a lot. It can depend on your media profile, whether you get a good story, what other things are happening in the world at that time that mean this particular emergency either gets the oxygen of media coverage or does not. And so again, I think some of the initiatives around perhaps insurance or other forms of humanitarian financing so that we can at least have predictable levels of income will empower local organizations because if you know that after a certain amount of drought or a certain level of flooding, you're going to get a minimum amount of money, that does at least allow you to improve your planning processes. So I think sustainable and predictable financing are, are, are clear barriers, inhibitors, but there are ideas um, on how that can be changed. The other one is organizational um, development, and, and as many local actors often uh, have, have complained to me, the financing available prioritizes response, um, but doesn't necessarily prioritize ongoing organizational development, which is actually the foundation to any capacity. So 
you know, investments in HR systems, in finance systems, in uh, governance arrangements, all those things are absolutely critical, but often go very underfunded. And then when it actually comes to the response itself, scaling up is an enormous challenge. You know, doubling the size of your organization, tripling the size of your organization, you know, it's, it's organizational development on steroids. And I think as a community, we often underinvest. So we may put money into the technical front end of how to organize the response, but we don't necessarily match that money with the kind of business systems needed to support that in a sustainable way so that we don't actually damage, um, you know, uh, the capacity that exists as we suddenly pump in all this resource. And then for cash in particular, there are, of course, particular organizational demands about how you handle cash, have particular demands on your finance system, as well as the technical competence to do the market mapping and analysis. So all these ongoing investments are, are required. Another sort of pet theory of mine is one of the inhibitors for long-term growth and development of local capacity is, is how risk is shared in the system. So if you imagine a system, uh, in, which we've tried to show in this slide, in which you've got a kind of flow of resources from donor to INGO to a local partner to a community, and within that system there's a certain amount of risk, the potential for something to go wrong, the potential for fraud, uh, mistakes, you know, just general risk, that is kind of shared throughout the system. But the nature of power, and I think we need to be honest about the power dynamics within the humanitarian system, is that the people in power seek to protect themselves. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you're a donor and you are responsible and accountable for the money you are given from your nation's taxpayers. It is appropriate to responsibly manage that. And that result is that the various compliance rules and procedures are put in place to protect the donor then those rules and compliance procedures are passed on to the INGOs who in turn seek to protect themselves with various rules and procedures. And the net result is that risk isn't dissipated but actually concentrated down to the local level. So I've certainly seen examples whereby um, local organizations' relationship with local communities have fractured because the organization was making promises about support, but due to delays in complying with various procedures and rules and regulations, the community actually lost trust, trust in the partner, and of course, ultimately, the community itself did not receive the services they needed. So I think we need to find a much better way of more equitably sharing the risk throughout the system. And the interesting dynamic about cash is, of course, that people um, actually have lower risk tolerance levels than they do for other forms of programming. Um, and we can debate the rights and wrongs of that, but the, there is a reality at the moment if we are to promote more cash within the humanitarian sector and more of that cash being spent by local organizations, we, we need to um, address some of these trust and risk management issues. And I think the essentially uh, one of the issues here is how do we make partnerships more predictable? I think a lot of feedback I've heard from local organizations is the, the sense of um, having to react to what uh, the humanitarian uh, system writ large demands of them. But there's not that sort of predict predictable ongoing conversation about well, how can we mutually plan for the absorption of extra resources? What are the roles and responsibilities? Quite often, um, local partners feel as though they get radio silence when reaching out to international partners in sort of quiet times. And then in the event of a national emergency, suddenly all these extra um, uh, organizations and people arrive and make all sorts of demands. Uh, and the, the, that sort of predictability and a genuine sense of partnership doesn't exist. And as I say, to sum up, I think what I've most often heard is this desire for an equitable sharing of benefits and risks between the international and local, and that's what will achieve the change um, we need. And I think, you know, it, it, fundamentally, to achieve this is a choice. It's a political choice about how we share power, how we share risk. Now, I, I would want to avoid this kind of binary debate of local is good, international is bad. I think each part of the system has a different role to play. And one of the phrases that emerged with the World Humanitarian Summit was the idea of an ecosystem um, of how the humanitarian system might function. If Thank anybody has much. any um, questions, I'm, I'm very happy to take some. Thank you very much, um, Nigel. Um, yeah, so um, 
Gillian, thanks for your comment about the sort of whether cash offers an answer to the sort of boom bust funding scenario. Um, possibly. I don't think it's a given, um, but I certainly think looking at some initiatives around, for example, shock responsive social protection systems is an interesting angle, whereby particularly if you're looking to support populations at scale, if you have a, a, a national government running a social safety net scheme, finding where, and, and that has a standing capacity to meet the, you know, the, the chronically, the chronic poverty issues within that, that country, finding ways to inject money so that that could flex in response to a particular crisis um, is, is, I think, a really interesting way in which we as a community need to look going forward to have response at scale but building on sustainable local capacity. Uh, that one very much the government one. So I think there are opportunities there, but it's not a given. Um, if there are no more questions from either at this point in time, um, then we'll be um, handing over to um, Satwick, please. All right, so um, what I was asked to speak about here is basically bringing in a private sector perspective and specifically looking at some of the elements in the agenda for cash uh, that relate to uh, establishing the uh, uh, preparedness necessary to be able to run cash programs at scale and also leveraging some of the unique kind of expertise and skill sets uh, within the private sector. Uh, and so how one of the ways that we think about this at Segovia is um, focused on looking at the, the various different kind of technology um, solutions that are out there that can facilitate um, uh, cash programming and what some of the challenges are that um, the kind of private sector tools out there can help with. So um, a couple examples I'll highlight here um, one is coordinating cash delivery mechanism across uh, different providers. So I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, uh, but basically to, to be able to scale out programs when you have multiple actors um, trying to run programs in a single country and you're trying to run across the entire country, being able to pay across providers um, you know, is an example of something that uh, if you're prepared up front and pre-positioned could be done. Uh, and then also looking at, uh, from a monitoring and evaluation perspective, using feedback from the program to affect uh, decisions in, in future programs. So as we think about, you know, how can we partner together to expand the impact of cash, uh, thinking about those lessons or learning within the programs, and then uh, with cash being a relatively straightforward modality compared to other in-kind uh, distributions, being able to more dynamically adjust what the distributions are based on feedback uh, is another example. Uh, there's a few others on here, and um, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, uh, to the group to, to look at these slides after and, and ping with questions. I thought it made more sense to, to quickly cover a broad set of areas in the limited time we have. Uh, so, Vincent, uh, next slide. Um, so, this is a uh, kind of a visual of how we think about, you know, the, the value of a uh, pre-positioned kind of open system that, that the private sector could, could partner with uh, uh, both the, the NGO community and the uh, and the public sector to build. So on the left, you see, you know, what what we're kind of envisioning, which is a, um, you know, an operating partner, an NGO operating uh, that has multiple providers um, that that they're able to uh, deal with. And um, if you if you think about in in the middle column here, you know, how that works today. How it often works is that you have direct relationships with each provider in each country and in each um, uh, different region within. The so when there's a new emergency or when there's a, um, a new program, uh, you have to actually go and build those relationships commercially and, and then uh, technically. Uh, what that often leads to is what you see on the right, which is a closed loop you know, type of system uh, where you know, it's a direct connection to a bank, to a voucher provider, even to a, uh, a telco where uh, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a direct loop between the partner and the specific provider that's be, uh, being worked with in a particular program. So one of the, the biggest pieces of uh, largest potential we see coming out of the agenda for cash is really thinking about how we can together work to do a, the, what's on the left here and pre-position a fully open system so that um, at any point in time in any country with any type of payment modality and payment provider, we can establish um, a, and as, as quickly as possible uh, in a cash program or response. Uh, so on the next slide, we go into a bit more detail on, you know, how, when, when we think about this open system, uh, how should that actually 
work. Um, when, when you think about technology tools that are provided by, by the private sector, uh, you're often forced to think about the specific capabilities of those tools and make a kind of high-level decision, do I want to go with, with solution one or solution two or solution three? Where what, what we really think is that the private sector should be focused on providing more choices, not fewer. So if we think about the ecosystem of data collection tools that are out there, the ecosystem of payment providers, the ecosystem of various ways that you're doing reporting, data exports, and so forth. All of these are relevant to uh, to properly kind of running a, a cash program, doing the upfront targeting, doing the distribution, and then monitoring, evaluating, reporting, and analyzing the data. Um, there really should be uh, uh, support and interoperability across these these various different players, and, and that's something that you know I think as we as we get into the implementation details on the agenda and focus on that uh, interoperability point that's made, thinking across these different dimensions is going to be pretty critical. Uh, on the next slide, the, um, uh, the looking at this more from a program perspective, when you think about um, designing you know, a program, we think about cash as kind of a, a, a simple distribution. But like any other program, there are a variety of different complexities involved in terms of the number of actors, uh, that have to participate, the, the various types of data that's coming in, whether it's existing social program data, whether it's new data that's being collected, uh, the various views that you want on the data, uh, whether you're administering the, the program in the field, whether you're in the finance team, whether you're doing looking at it from a monitoring, um, as well as the, the overall kind of beneficiary experience. What is the workflow that they're going through? How, how do they... Um, uh, how, how does the operating partner interact with the beneficiary across the various different stages? Um, how do we determine, you know, eligibility? How do we schedule the right set of payments? And with cash, we have an opportunity to deliver more frequent payments or deliver lump sums that have a, a specific kind of conditionality and a specific uh, um, uh, timeline. And then finally, um, what are the dashboards that, uh, you know, that are needed to manage all of this? So if we think about those as kind of different dimensions of a, uh, you know, how you'd actually go about implementing a program, um, when we think about the, the partnership possibility with the, the private sector and, you know, various NGOs, I think one of, the, one of the key things is thinking about not just how are we going to enable cash, but how are we going to enable cash to operate in, um, in, a, in a manner that provides flexibility across all these different uh, dimensions. Let me go on to the next slide. So um, actually, we'll um, uh, we'll skip ahead, Vincent, to the next slide beyond this. So so another an another key kind of uh, motivation for um, yeah, for preparedness across you know various different contexts is that when we think about financial inclusion, which is mentioned in the agenda, um, it's really something that um, you know is is often limited by the context uh, that's available. So for example. The, the common way to think about, you know, running a cash program that leads to financial inclusion is by running the program and delivering mobile money so that everyone is, is left kind of onboarded onto a mobile money platform and can further participate in uh, financial services. However, as we all know, in certain contexts, uh, either because of rules in the program or because of uh, connectivity or other uh, challenges, um, we go to a voucher type of program. We go to a um, either an electronic voucher or other some type of offline you know, voucher type capability. And uh, and the common kind of uh, uh, perspective is that this uh, you know this leads to uh, kind of limits on on financial inclusion because it's a it's a closed system. Where we actually see uh, there, there's tremendous possibility here to um, to look at solutions in context of each of these scenarios. And think about even in those cases where you know there there are limitations on um, uh, on, on on power in a refugee camp or in, on uh, connectivity or on the uh, agent coverage. How can we think about building those systems that can still be transferred, um, uh, you know, to other contexts? So, for example, you know, going into a uh, an environment that doesn't have um, connectivity and delivering a, a voucher system where the the, the mobile wallet data is still stored in the cloud and can be transitioned as that beneficiaries in that context move to other areas or resettled or can be uh, uh, or, or connectivity is introduced into the region. Uh, so can we go to the next slide? Um, what I um, what I wanted to, to kind of emphasize here as we think about 
the, the kind of partnership possibility is. Um, the, the previous slides have talked about, you know, what are, what are the different elements of, uh, you know, actually executing a program that private sector actors can potentially do. Um, another thing that, that we, you know, think a lot about is what is the expertise that's in the, the private sector community through work in other industries, through work, um, you know, with, um, with thinking about systems that have been built for, um, you know, for example, for securing data in the financial or the healthcare ecosystem and it really comes down to thinking about data protection and security in the context of various different principles which are which are laid out on this slide uh, again I'll leave this for as kind of homework reading for everyone but uh, but the key thing I want to emphasize as you look through these different things are that we're proposing a set of best practices here that relate to um, the uh, the sector but that are uh, that are derived from best practices that are that are seen in other sectors where you know, it's, it's as important to protect individual data and to secure systems from, from external threats. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll pause and uh, take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Um, that was a very um, rich uh, presentation and lots of food for thought. Actually, Patrick, I will um, take the um, freedom for a very quick question. In your um, opinion, what do you think would be the main change that you would like to see happening um, in the coming period now to keep the energy and the momentum after the World Humanitarian Summit for a change in the way that currently partnerships are done with the private sector? I think I'd, I'd, I'd love to see multiple organizations getting together and investing in, in a system with some of the principles that I outlined. So, you know, let's pick a country, pick a type of distribution, let's let's pick, you know, kind of constrain the, the problem to a set of dimensions and then let's build a, um, you know, a system together that can be used as a shared service for uh, delivering cash. I think we have that potential here in a way that we didn't have with uh, many of the other forms of distribution that have occurred. Thank you very much. Um, so, I think with that, we'll uh, move on to Julia, are you with us, Julia? Thanks a lot. We were coming to this um, from a slightly different angle. So, as you said, Sarah, especially in the run-up to the World Humanitarian Summit, cash was one of the, the big hopes. And to our minds, this is not just because it promises so many benefits in itself, but also because it resonates positively with other things we would like to see in the humanitarian system. Um, Nigel mentioned localization, and indeed, cash might help the localization because people can start and buy from local actors. But I think also in terms of accountability to affected populations and the, the dignity and the choice um, that affected people themselves have um, is something that we have difficulty otherwise implementing, and, and cash really helps us. Yet, Sarah, as you said, the summit did not bring what we really hoped for which was an, an acceptance of the reform demand, which is to have cash as the, as the default uh, delivery modality in the humanitarian system. The other element, what the reform demands were really asking for, is to implement cash programs as multi-sector cash programs. So rather than uh, vouchers or cash for something specific, cash for food or cash for shelter, it's to say, let's rather do large-scale uh, and multi-sector cash programs where it is up to the beneficiaries to really decide which needs are their priorities and how um, they, they will want to use this. What we looked at um, is to see where maybe some of the resistance to cash comes from because as we've heard already, um, if we went along with this proposal to go to, for cash as default, this would really implement and um, this would really imply some rather big changes for the humanitarian system and some of these disruptions. I've just outlined a, a couple of elements here on, on how we think the humanitarian system would change if we went to cash at scale. Firstly, we made a, a calculation in a small model um, that comes out saying we would expect around about 40% of the total humanitarian budget to be spent in the form of cash. Um, and that takes into account that after there are certain areas where there are simply no markets, so there you can't do cash. And then there are certain types of programs such as protection and then in some contexts also health 
um, or, or education that, that cannot be done through, through cash. But nevertheless, 40% of the total budget, um, where at the moment we have 6%, um, that, that's a huge change. Also, since we think that the cash should be implemented as large scale and multi sector cash programs, obviously there's only a few organizations um, that will probably end up getting these large cash programs and implementing them. Um, most of the other smaller and single sector organizations would probably not be involved unless they join consortia or similar uh, instruments, but they would probably not be involved in actually putting out that cash. Um, because uh, it's multi-sector cash programs, the current organizing principles of the system, namely sectors and clusters, would lose some of their relevance and with them some of the organizations that lead these sectors. And I think um, Julian in, this, in, in your comment already raised that there are studies out there that uh, uh, cash is significantly cheaper to deliver, which means that it less, leaves less money for staff, systems and organizational development. Obviously, overall, it will probably create a pressure on, on the overhead costs um, if, if there is such a more efficient uh, delivery modality. And I think that finally, as we just heard from Satwick, um, this might bring in completely new actors into the, the system, telecoms providers, banks, uh, vendors, and so on. And, and again, um, this might challenge some of the traditional turf of the humanitarian organizations. We tried to analyze how such a change would affect the interests in the, and incentives of different types of stakeholders in, the, in a more systematic way. And the good thing is that, um, and this is different from other reform areas that we looked at, is that we found that overall there's quite a positive constellation of interests that might actually make it possible to implement this reform proposal. You have the only group of stakeholders that is clearly losing out in this reform are those organizations that are labeled here as the non-leads. It's those organizations that cannot reasonably hope to be the implementers of large-scale cash programs. Obviously, they would lose market share of their traditional programs, and in addition, they would be exposed to this pressure on the overhead costs that I mentioned. But there is a really potentially very powerful uh, constellation of two active groups um, that have a positive interest here, in the donors and the potential lead organizations of cash, that even though you know it's not a, a rosy picture all the way through, on the whole would probably win, um, especially if they think that the move to cash is inevitable anyways. For donors, I think one of the really big drivers is the, the cost efficiency uh, that was mentioned. We all know how much current needs exceed the financial resources that are being made available, and then obviously to find a modality that enables to reach more people with the same financial resources is extremely attractive. For the cash leads, I think it's also quite clear, of course, for them undergoing the restructuring um, and also dealing with these lower overhead costs is, is uh, quite a tough nut to swallow. But at the same time, because they would get these large scale contracts, they could hope to get quite a lot of uh, overall increase in their budget and with it in power and visibility. The big unknown in this, in this constellation is the, the host governments or the affected governments. And here we think it will really depend on, on the specific constellation. Because on the one hand, there are, will be governments, especially those that have broader social protection networks in place already, that will be able to gain hugely from cash programming in terms of their own legitimacy, especially if their mechanisms are being used. And governments might also be very interested in the benefits that cash can bring for the local economy. But on the other hand, uh, governments, especially those dealing with a refugee population, might be worried about tensions between refugees and, and host communities because, as we know, giving out cash somehow in the popular opinion is quite different from handing out bags of, of rice and, and bread. And if they have no uh, safety nets and social protection systems in place, they might be afraid that they will face pressure to create such systems and, and don't have the money to do it. Where does this all leave us? 
um, we felt that this kind of thinking about cash has quite clear policy implications. The first one is that those donors who are interested in this should actually just go ahead and pilot these types of large-scale multi-sector cash programs in order to signal to the humanitarian community that cash is coming. And so if you want to be on the train, you better start preparing now. It's a very important signaling effect here. If they do this cleverly, we think that they should award these, these pilot contracts competitively, ideally choosing different organizations in different contexts so that you have more organizations that think, you know, if, if we prepare properly, we might be one of the cash leads and therefore it would be worth our while investing in all the preparedness that you need for that. And at the same time, we believe that there should be an investment in assessing the cost efficiency of these programs because, as we heard earlier, um, this is one of the main reasons that might drive donors in particular to, to support cash programming. Now, at the same time, we believe that um, since governments uh, of affected governments have such a large potential power to either encourage or obstruct cash programming, we believe that overall uh, the cash debate should pay a lot more attention to what affected governments think and what their interests and incentives have. One way that this might play out is that it might make a lot of sense to put more support into the more regular social protection programs um, that are usually sponsored from the development side. And this might be one area where humanitarians might usefully engage with, with development actors. But also, since the, the effects on local economies are, are an, an important incentive for governments, it would be worthwhile investing more in both assessing the effects that cash programs have and then communicating this to, to governments. And the final element that we came up with was to say, Donors themselves, even though they have a strong interest, we believe, in, in going for cash, um, they sometimes face opposition from their own government and also from their own general publics because there is very often a, a negative image of, of cash that has to do with the, the national debates about social welfare programs with a lot of prejudices about, you know, people will only use this to buy alcohol and cigarettes the, the kinds of phrases that you know, and where we think you know, it, might, it might make sense to invest in a public image campaign to support uh, the donors um, and help them move into cash. That's um, what our analysis of the, the interests and, and, and incentives underlying a potential cash uh, brought up, and I very much look forward to, to any questions you might have. Excellent. Thank you very much, Julia. So um, I think by that, why don't we open the floor for specific questions to Julia, but also questions to the other panelists in case they are. Seeing one question here from Julian um, about uh, what is the need for NGOs, um, especially smaller and and local ones, um, and. I think this is a very uh, valid question because, indeed, I think just through the, the, the cash, we, we would expect to see a consolidation of actors and the shift either to consortia of, of smaller organizations or to the larger organizations that then handle the, the, the cash component. Now, the role for, for NGOs, to my mind, could be twofold. One could be to still do the complementary cash programming, which um, will become no less important. It might become more difficult to implement because it might look less attractive compared to the cash. But I think everybody agrees that there is no scenario where everything will move to cash. There will always be need for protection. There will always be need for certain um, educational and normative components, in many instances, health, education, and, and so on. And then there is a big debate about how the different components of the cash programming might be distributed. So whether we should stick to the current model that we have, where the same organization is usually responsible for assessing needs, delivering the program, and then monitoring the success. And there's an argument out there for splitting these functions up and um, distributing them over different organizations. And I think here as well, uh, NGOs could, could take uh, a role. For very local organizations, I think simply being on the marketplace might be extremely interesting because 
Um, if we have much more cash, they might be able to simply offer their services for payment, and they would actually then leave the choice to beneficiaries to say whether they want to uh, buy um, the goods and services from the local NGOs or from the international ones. Maybe one of the things that uh, we um, heard coming across here, which would be interesting to explore further, is a little bit um, what Julia also mentioned. What is actually um, going to be the, the role of affected governments, and what is the government's response to um, the change that, that that can bring about? And that is something that um, we did see was. Um, a bit missing in the World Humanitarian Summit, also due to the um, arguably limited number of governments also that participated. So it would be interesting to hear also from participants what they think is the best way of really bringing in government into the broader cash discussion. It. I guess, Julia, I will, uh, by default, assign that question to you. Was there a particular um, finding that you found in your, in your research with regards to more innovative ways to facilitate um, bringing government around the table? Well, as I, as I outlined, um, I, generally we think that, as you said, it's a, it's a hugely underestimated uh, element of the debate. Um, when we looked at who has how much power to either push for this reform or block it, governments really came out at the top and as extremely unpredictable um, uh, types of stakeholders. Um, we felt that a really, really constructive way of engaging governments would be via the development angle and through the social protection uh, systems. Because if there is support um, also from the international community before a crisis hits in setting up a cash-based social protection system, then you're in a much better position um, once a crisis hits to try and see whether parts of the system can be used to also channel the, the humanitarian assistance. Um, obviously, this is something um, that is more for a natural disaster type context and much less for, for a conflict context where the government would probably uh, have more reason to try and, 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 and bias where, where, the, uh, where the resources go. Um, also, um, if there has been resistance to cash programming, um, there is this feeling that it could create pressure, you know, in the longer term for, for governments who don't have these social protection networks to create them for their own population, and where governments then have worries um, on how they would finance that. And so we thought that if humanitarians move in with a suggestion to, to go for cash, it could be really, really helpful if at the same time there were some development actors engaged in the discussion that could already start planning how in the longer term this would transition into, into a social protection uh, system. So this is, you know, from my, my, from, from my perspective, this is the, the most uh, constructive angle uh, from which to engage the governments. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, Christian from, from DCA, you had an interesting question here. What can we do to advocate for cash in Europe, Greece, Balkans, where CCP is seen as an additional co-factor and as a facilitating onward movement? Yeah, this is a really tricky, tricky question, and I think we see it in in uh, the positions of of our governments. Even once once people are here, that they go back to to less uh, cash. Um, I think through efficiency might be one of the ways. If we could um, argue more credibly that the entire system to support the refugees will be. And we don't have a number at the moment. Some people say 30%, some people could say 40%. Julian earlier mentioned 50% cheaper. Um, I mean, that is, a, that is a strong argument also for governments here to say, okay, well, if, it, if we have such a, such a large saving by switching to cash, um, that, that would be um, more relevant. The public image campaign, um, you know, do I know whether it will help or not? Of course I don't, but I think there have been campaigns in the past where people have tried to change public perception. And I think for, for addressing particularly the part about um, refugees will just 
use this uh, in, in a way that, that, you know, doesn't correspond to what we have envisaged. So they will use it on alcohol and smugglers and I, I, I don't know what. Um, I think their communications effort might, might help. Thank you very much, Julia. And um, Patrick also um, had a conversation here together with Daniel Horn in terms of evaluating cash transfers, especially as it relates to baselines and follow-ups and to determining economic multipliers. Um, and Satwick pointed out um, some of the good work that's been done there, including with the Give Directly. So if, so if there, there are particular, particular questions, questions pertaining to Satwick's experience there, feel free to message him privately. Um, Nigel has had to leave us due to a prior commitment. Uh, we are happy to stay online for another 10 minutes or so if there are more questions to either uh, Julia or Sussex or to Carl. I can see another question having come in here from um, Kennedy O'Rourke um, asking, with a move towards cash, do we foresee financial service providers also becoming humanitarian. In other words, why do we need the current constellation of humanitarian actors? Maybe a sort of joint uh, response from uh, Satwick and Julia would be interesting on that one. Satwick, what do you think? Do you see yourself as a humanitarian? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the way I look at it is that um, financial service providers are, are financial service providers, and in the same way that you know, with other forms of humanitarian aid, there were there were always suppliers in the mix. There were you know vendors of food. There there are logistics and shipping companies. There's you know other actors involved um, who who played a role in the humanitarian um, delivery of aid. Financial service providers are are similar there. I think they'll they'll definitely need to provide more um, uh, you know kind of thought and, um, you know, potentially adjust business models to serve humanitarian use cases. But I think in the end of the day, um, I don't think it's kind of an either or, uh, you know, type of distinction whether you're humanitarian or not. Thank you very much, Satwick. And um, Julia, there's a specific question here with regards to social protection um, government system. So the question is um, from uh, Jimena. With the uh, social protection government system, do we also expect a big shift to bilateral funding, bridging NGOs? Okay. Um, I think both of these questions are a little bit about the, the traditional turf of the, the humanitarian NGOs. And regarding the private sector, I think I fully agree with, with Satwick. Um, uh, so financial service providers, I do not believe, will become humanitarians. They will remain financial service providers, and the programming part and all the more normative decisions about, you know, who should receive, how much should people receive, how should they receive, um, will and I believe also should remain uh, the, the sphere of, of the humanitarian actors. Yet at the same time, because um, much less money will be needed um, in terms of, of overhead, um, and others might be doing the technical implementation of, of these cash programs. Um, I do think that um, some NGOs might simply lose their, their market base or their, their business case and might go out of business. Um, the role of the government systems um, is the other factor that can put some of the NGOs un under pressure. Again, I think it would be important for uh, the humanitarians to remain involved in, in most of the normative decisions, but if there is a government that is not uh, a party to a conflict in, in, the, in a particular crisis and sort of well-intentioned and genuinely wants to help people and there is a system that is set up, um, of course the humanitarians should, should use that, but I think in that case it's almost uh, either or, you either go to a private a financial service provider to help implement this technically, or you go through through a government channel uh, that already pre-exists and to try to see whether you can uh, use it for your criteria and, and, and selection elements and, and so on. And in both cases, it will take away work from, from the classic humanitarians, but there's still a very, very important role that they will keep playing, both in the 
remaining 60% that will be non-cash, um, and then in the normative elements of cash programming. Thank you, Julia. Um, there was another question here um, regarding working with local organizations, um, and as Nigel had to leave, part of it also relates to cash, so um, I will try to give an answer to that to Gina Baroni, and uh, we'll also give opportunities for, for others to interact if they're interested. So the question is whether um, relates to whether it's easier or not to work with local organizations during conflict than natural disaster, and the same question related to cash transfer programming. And I think it is very interesting, particularly looking at the vast uh, majority of um, crisis and disaster affected populations um, today, about 80% or so being in conflict affected areas. And in the World Humanitarian Summit, that was also something that local organizations very much pushed for as an argument that we need more funding, we need sustainable funding for longer term capacity development because at the end of the day, we are much more likely in these contexts to be on the forefront um, than many international organizations. Um, so related to what Julia said, if then there is a real investment um, for organizations to be able to position themselves, then um, that is certainly something that would pertain also to cash transfer programming. What I would say generally on, on programming, good programming is needed whether it is for cash or in kind. Um, and um, I'm not sure the way of cash transfer programming will be different in a uh, conflict environment than, than a natural disaster in terms of particularly how you can work with scaling up of, of local systems and traditional actors versus government, etc. Um, but I, I certainly think that the um, movement at the moment, particularly from local actors, is very much that um, they are ready also to, to engage um, in, in line with the humanitarian imperative and where there is also a clear comparative advantage for local actors to, um, to be, be taking the lead. That leads us up until the end of the webinar. Um, I'm just monitoring here that there are no key questions that we haven't um, looked at. There was one here regarding insurance for poor and low-income countries, which is so interesting, I think. Um, and um, it was raised by Margaret uh, Stiregar, with apologies for the pronunciation maybe not being right. What about insurance for poor low income, especially during disaster, the long-term vision of cash programming preparedness, which also relate to their resilience? And um, that which you've also interacted from that. There is some pilot work that is being uh, done uh, around this. Um, it is an area um, that I know a couple of actors are looking at. Um, I myself do not have a lot of expertise in that area, but if other members of, of the webinar have, please do respond to the, the chain that Margaret and, and Sathwick was um, engaging in. There are no further questions. Um, I just want to end with expressing a big, big thank you for everyone participating in, in the webinar, and a particular thank you to Julia and Sathwick and Nigel to join on the um, panel. Thank you for um, engaging in the agenda and discussions around cash, and Please watch the space of the CALP community of practice, cashlearning.org, and uh, continue to engage as we are moving further in keeping that momentum and vision around the World Union Summit moving on. Um, thank you very much for joining us, and have a good rest of the day wherever you are. Thank you. Bye-bye.